Assalamu alaikum. Dear viewers, I welcome you to the second episode of our program, A Discussion with the Women Icons, organized by Legal Voice Foundation, and I'm your host, Nadima Khan. This episode has been sponsored by UWE Bristol and Excel Education, and our media partner is LawyersClubBangladesh.com. Legal Voice Foundation is a non-profit, non-political organization working for the general citizens with the aim of protecting the rights guaranteed in parts two and three of the Constitution of Bangladesh by raising public awareness. Legal Voice Foundation, as a part of its Raising Public Awareness initiative, organized different programs, seminars, published magazine, and different public awareness raising campaigns, where discussions regarding pressing issues with distinctive guests are talked about. And today, we have invited a prominent human rights activist, someone who hugely contributed in the development of human rights areas in Bangladesh and to ensure that these rights are protected. It is a privilege and pleasure for us to welcome Dr. Hamida Hussain. Hello, Appa. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. How are you, Appa? I'm very well, thank you. In spite of the COVID. Uh, I'll introduce Dr. Hamida Hussain to our viewers, even though she doesn't need an introduction. Dr. Hamida Hussain is a human rights activist and writer. She graduated from Wellesley College, USA, and earned her PhD from Oxford University. Dr. Hamida Hussain has published several books and articles relating to different areas of human rights. Her publications include the company Weavers of Bengal Textile Production for the East India Company, 1750 to 1813, No Better Options, a study of women industrial workers co-authored with Salma Sobhan and Roshan Jahan, of a nation born, which was edited with Amina Osi. She is a founding member of Aino Shalishkendro, a leading legal aid and human rights organization working since 1986. She has been involved with the development of Aino Shalishkendro and has edited Aino Shalishkendro's human right, annual human rights reports between the years 1996 and 2006. She was also one of the founder members of the acclaimed weekly magazine Forum, which was closed by by the martial law regime on 25th March, 1971. At present, she's serving as the chairman of Research Initiatives Bangladesh, which works with marginal communities to raise concerns of discrimination on the basis of their origin, caste or, caste or gender. In the 60s, Dr. Hamida Hussain worked as editor at the Oxford University Press. Appa, we will go to uh, our questions. Thank my you. That's question very complimentary. <laughs> You're welcome, Appa. Appa. My first question is that: What was your childhood like? Well, I grew up in Sin. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about that part of South Asia. <laughs> but uh, my father was a judge, and he used to be posted in small towns, and it was very, very conservative. But my my own parents, particularly my father, was a very progressive person, and he was very keen on us getting educated, particularly uh, there were six of us in the family, six children, three brothers, and I have two sisters, and he was particularly keen on girls getting the education. I don't know where he got this from, except that he was quite a colonial gentleman, very uh, servile to the British in those days. This was long before independence of India. And uh, so this is how we live when I was very, very young. And then we moved to Karachi and I was uh, admitted to a school, a convent school, where there were the nuns were from, I think from Wales or Ireland or somewhere like that. And uh, so we led a fairly, um, you know, uh, I mean, the children were expected to be very obedient to the nuns and not to contradict them in class and that kind of thing. So that was a bit difficult. But on the other hand, Karachi was a fairly cosmopolitan place and nobody was bothered about whether we were Muslims or Christians or Hindus. Nobody even asked us that question. So, you know, that has changed a lot now. Absolutely. 
Appa, what are your best memories of school days? Uh, my best memories, I think, are my friendships. And particularly uh, in Karachi, we used to all go to school together, we used to ride bicycles and go there. When I tell my daughters that I used to go on a bicycle, they're really quite shocked because nowadays in Dhaka, we see hardly any girls going on their own, leave it on bicycle, they have to be escorted to school. Such times have changed, you know. So that was one thing. Then we used to put on a lot of plays and dramas in school. And our teachers used to encourage us to do that. But what they didn't encourage us to do was to talk in class, you know, to answer back and say, no, I don't think this is right. I think this is right. They were very strict. They would tell us something and we were expected to remember it. So it was still learning by rote. Um, but I think uh, also what I remember is that um, we had a lot of uh, scope for competitions and I used to enjoy that a lot. Appa, you already told us that your father was a very progressive gentleman. Um, uh, so part of my question has been answered, but, uh, but I would still read it out to you. How much importance was uh, was given to women's education back in those days. And you graduated from Wellesley College in the US and got your PhD from Oxford University. How much support and mot motivation did you receive from your family to go abroad and to pursue your education and do your PhD, which is considered as one of the highest le level of degree one can achieve? Well, I'll tell you, Sindh was a very conservative place to some extent. I think it, I haven't seen it now, but I think it still is. And, um, you know, there were Hindus and Muslims living there. The Hindus were quite uh, progressive. They used to travel, they were business people. So they used to travel outside the country and had business as far as Fiji Islands and uh, Kenya and the other uh, countries in both Africa and Latin America and even England. Um, but the Muslims are very, very conservative. They were mainly farmers. And particularly for their women, used to go around in Borkha. And, uh, you know, most of them did not study, actually. So it was very interesting that when partition took place on the August or 14th of August, and I came to school on the 15th of August, and there were only 10 of us students in the school. All the rest had been Hindus, and they had either not come to school or they had left the country. So that was the situation between Muslims and Hindus. Muslim families were conservative, Hindus not so, they were world travel, not so conservative. But in our case, in my case, my father was a very, very progressive person. And even in my uh, mother's family, my mother was, uh, you know, studied, she didn't go to school, she studied at home. But her sisters, one of them became a doctor, uh, one of them became a headmistress for school. So even in her family, education was quite important. So I think uh, uh, I think that it varied. Uh, but generally, Sindhis are very conservative. Sindhi Muslims are very conservative about the women, particularly, and that was not very nice. I must say. I think my sisters suffered from that because they probably had to wear a burqa, and then they finally they had to take it off. Um, as for going to Wellesley, it was quite interesting what happened because. Before Wellesley, I was in college then, the first year of college in Hyderabad, Sin. And one day my principal came to me and said that, you know, would you like to write an essay? So I said, what about? He said, the world we want. Write down what you want the world to be. So I said, that's very easy. I don't have to study for that. And so he said, yes, I want you to write. And there are two other students because only three of you can write in English. Everybody else studies in Sindhi. So we sat down to write. And a few months later, I get this letter from the New York Herald Tribune, which was then a very leading New York newspaper. And they said that I have been selected with 24 other students from out Asia, all of Asia. And there were going to be two students from Pakistan who were selected to go to America for three months to visit with American students, to go to their schools, and to see what their life is like. It's one of those ways that Americans have of trying to convert us to their way of life. But I really, uh, that was quite an eye opener and quite a culture shock, I think. And while I was there, the person who was running this program, um, I got to know her very well. And she said, look, why don't you come back and study? So I said, no, how can I come all the way? Who's going to pay my fees? You know, that's impossible. 
She said, no, no, we'll try and manage that, but why don't you apply? So I said, well, I don't even know who to apply to. So she gave me names of two or three colleges, and I looked up Wellesley College, and there was um, Nayantara Segal had studied there. You know, she was Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, Nehru's niece. And two, other, two or three other familiar names I'd come across in books. So I applied to Wellesley, and I got a full scholarship. And because they had a very uh, generous endowment program from their founders. And then I got a travel scholarship from Fulbright. Uh, Senator Fulbright of the Congress, a US Congress, had set up this, this particular scholarship program, travel grant program for students who were getting admission to American schools. So that's how I ended up at Wellesley College. And I did my BA degree from there. And that's what happened. Oxford came much later. That was when, in 1975, after Bangabundu was assassinated, and we couldn't stay here, we decided to leave the country. And we were away for, I think, six, seven years. And uh, my husband then had, uh, had a fellowship in All Souls College in Oxford. He'd already got that. So we had gone back to that. They'd given us a place to stay in. And my daughters were then about six years and eight years. And so they were going to school. And I didn't see myself wasting my time sitting at home cooking for everybody. All we did was have sandwiches and beef burgers anyway. So I decided to see if I could uh, do some uh, academic work. And I went to see the head of the um, Indian history department. He was Tapan Rai Chaudhary, the famous professor then. And he said, well, what do you want to work on? Because I had not been an academic. I hadn't done much studies. So I said, you know, while in Dhaka, before this, I was very involved with craftspeople and weavers in particular. And that was, you know, I saw them, the way they conditioned the work in the 60s and 70s. So he said, well, that's very good. Why don't you go back to some history books and see how the weavers survived earlier on when they were working for the Mughals or when they were working for the East India Company and other companies. So, and he said, I don't know if you'll find very much, but go and look, that might be a good subject. So when I went to the library in Oxford, there were two or three books I read, uh, two or three authors had mentioned it, but they gave me sources of um, where to look for the original sources. And all the company records were, of course, in the British Library. So I had this rich source of material to work on, so it made it very easy for me to do my PhD. So several years later, I actually submitted my thesis to the committee. This is why this was on a very unique topic. Sorry, I can't hear. Your thesis was on a very unique topic. Yes, yes. I think it's still very useful. <laughs> of course. In, in the year 1969, you, along with some other members, established the famous magazine Forum. Uh, what inspired you to start its publication? Uh, it was not in 69. Actually, I came to Bangladesh uh, to stay here after I got married, I think in 65. And uh, Kamal and Rahman both had were working together. With, I mean, they used to meet together with a lot of young people, Anis Zaman and so on, Professor Razak in the Dhaka University. And they had big ideas about how the society must change, how particularly the way you are, you people are talking about how to change society. So they were talking about the same thing. And before this, they had tried to get some, uh, written some uh, oh, sort of pamphlets, which they had distributed and so on. But then we thought, well, why not bring out a proper magazine? There were also two journalists involved with us, Muhyiddin Hassan, and there was another one called, I think, I forget his name, but he died in a plane crash before we could start off. And the idea of bringing out forum is to say it should express the views of the Bangladeshi or Bangalis. Um, because there was, in the 60s particularly, there was this question being raised in different places by Sheikh Mujib, by other Tajuddin, by other leaders. It was a political problem of discrimination against the Bengalis because they were not having access to decision making. There was um, inequality of economic opportunities and so on. So we thought we'd bring out a weekly magazine. It was not a monthly magazine. And that we would write about what people were saying. So we managed to get a lot of good writers, like leading economists, like 
uh, Noor Islam, Dr. Noor Islam, Dr. Anisa Rahman, Rahman Subhan, they used to write regularly. And then we had political pages which commented on what was going on. And particularly uh, at the time, there was a martial law regime. So what, what they were doing. And also, what was the resistance emerging within this country? And uh, well, so we applied for that. Uh, you had to have a declaration from the government to bring it out. So we applied for the declaration, I think, in 66. And the only reason I got involved in it was because that was my profession as an editor. I had worked as an editor at the Oxford University Press. And so they felt that I would, you know, technically I'd be able to help them. But then I got involved in the politics of it. And so uh, we applied for the declaration in 66, but we finally got permission, I think, in 60, end of 67 or 68. So we started the magazine in, in towards the end of 68. So we only had about two years, uh, two and a half years before it was closed. It was closed on 25th of March, 1971. That's right, yes. The last issue was just ready to go to the press, but we couldn't take it because then, you know, there were the curfews. Uh, distance, freedom of press is a debatable issue. How was it back in those days when you first started the Forum magazine? How was the media back then played the role of advocating human rights without being biased? Ah, now this was a martial law regime with very strict rules. And uh, so in order to uh, win that declaration, we had to sign some sort of paper saying that we would abide by the rules and laws of the country. And that, you know, the usual kind of thing. And I think the word human rights was hardly used in those days. It was much more, uh, you know, the state versus um, uh, political parties here or the state versus even state versus citizens would come up of course the kind of arrests that took place particularly uh, closure of newspapers and so on but uh, it was very difficult to challenge that because in under martial law regime the courts did not um, exercise the kind of power that they did later uh, but if you want to compare it to what it is now i think there are too many restrictions on freedom of the press and freedom of speech ordinary people today we have this uh, digital security act as you know several people have been arrested for very uh, i don't even consider those reasons arresting a 15 year old boy or taking somebody who's uh, who's who's seen in just about arresting him because he happened to be near the border and there are no explanations given i mean what exactly is it that the little boy has said we still don't know so i think uh, i think this is not a Martial law regime is. I hope it won't become that, but but it certainly is um, not very tolerant to freedom of speech. And unless you have freedom of speech and freedom of thought, you're going to become a stultified society. You're not going to think for yourself. You know, it will be like going back to uh, my convent school, where they told you to repeat whatever the teacher said. Stand the corner if you don't know. So now you're being made to stand the corner. You're also one of the founder member of Aino Shalish Kendra. So what was the motivation behind the establishment of Aino Shalish Kendra? Uh, well, I'll tell you how it began. Uh, we were then in Oxford. Salma Subhan, who is also the main person behind Aino Shalish Kendra, uh, she and I were practically living together in one house uh, during our exile days. And before I left for uh, before we left for Oxford, um, I had been very involved with crafts, particularly women crafts people, artisans. And apart from whatever work they did and the, the whole issue of women not earning enough and not earning equal amounts as the men did and all that, those questions, they would, the women artisans would come to me and say, talk to me about their domestic problems, which are no different uh, than they are now. You know, they didn't talk so much about violence because they were, I think, shy, too shy in those days to talk about it. And much women have become much more open now. Uh, but they used to, you know, come and complain, what should I do now? Can you help me? That kind of thing. So there were so many of these stories coming to me. And I didn't really know because here I was dealing with the economic activity. And I didn't really know what does one do? You know, after all, I was not a lawyer. 
So I didn't know that. Um, just a second. Um, um, so, and Salma had been teaching with a lawyer, and she was teaching in the university before she left. And so when we were in Oxford, we both had very little to do. We would talk about what would we do when we went back again to Bangladesh. So, you know, we, I discussed with her the problems I faced. She said, look, I don't want to be in academics anymore. It's too theoretical. I want to get down into practical life. So let's work something together. Then when we came back, uh, I think in the early 80s, and just then, 82, Irshad has seized power, was again being very autocratic and was again arresting people and doing things. And they used to, about 83 or 84, the protests started against him. And we were used to be part of that, standing out in the press club and shouting slogans and so on. And then we used to come across our friends there. There was Amir Islam, there was Justice Subhan, there was Aved. So we all talked together that what will we do? Okay, we will have elections. We probably will get a civilian government. But is that civilian government also going to be authoritative? And how will ordinary people uh, uh, face up to it? How will they solve their problems? Do we, are elections the only ways to solve problems? They don't solve the problems. They don't even know about the problems. Once political parties are elected, they don't understand what ordinary people are going through. So that's how this whole idea came up. And Amir Islam actually said that we should do something, trying to set up something which would mediate disputes. And in those days, we thought about really family disputes, not beyond. So we thought, you know, particularly since four or five of the members we were talking to were lawyers, and they would have dealt with uh, the question legally rather than anything else. So we agreed. We said, fine. Um, the lawyers would do the mediation, and the rest of us would act like uh, peons or something, providing the backup services. Um, so that's how it started off, in a very simple way as a mediation center. But then we found <clears throat> that our, the problems that were brought to us were so serious that they went beyond the question of uh, mediation. And that's where the lawyers began to play a much more active role in taking cases up to the court. And as we started going to the court then, it wasn't just individual cases that came up. I mean, like the cases relating to uh, uh, people living in bustis and slums, how they were being evicted and their rights were being violated. So it wasn't just political rights or the rights of freedom of speech. It was something even more basic. Their right to work was not being granted to them. And issues of that kind. So that's how then gradually Ayn Shalish moved on, not merely to solving minor disputes or taking women's cases to court, but moved on to the whole broad issue of human rights, challenging the state, challenging the police, Today, you know, the kind of extrajudicial killing that are taking place. These cases are taken up in court by the lawyers. Not that we always win the cases, but we have been successful in trying, in, in getting quite a few uh, lawyers, senior lawyers also, to support us. Recently, I don't know if you heard that um, the advocate Idris Rahman died just uh, a few, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Now, he was one of our leading lawyers. He was a member of Ayn Shalish. He became a member later. He started doing our cases, then he became a member. And yesterday when we were doing a memorial for him, I was also surprised that there were so many different issues he had taken up, uh, uh, you know, slum settlement, uh, Limon's case, if you remember that, when Rab had arrested and shot at him. And so many cases that we've never heard of a little girl whose kidney was taken away, transplanted by mistake, and the doctor was not being held accountable, so many, and challenging the state on so many things. So then we moved into a human rights uh, agenda, and the human rights agenda for Ayn Shalish, I know there are a lot of human rights organizations in Bangladesh, particularly BLAST, a very big legal aid organization, but the difference is, I think, for Ayn Shalish, that we go beyond the law. So for instance, if we hear of something happening, we immediately send our investigator out to find out, go and see an independent investigation. Then we try and document whatever's happening. So we look at all the newspapers and see what they're saying. And then uh, before that, we go to groups of people and create awareness about their rights. But unless people are aware of their rights, they're not going to come and say, I know, uh, I, I, you cannot, they cannot deny 
or defy the government or defy whoever is violating rights. So that's how we added on one thing to another. And then there was research into human rights violations. And that's how the human rights reports came out. So it added on to the basic legal aid work. What motivated you to be one? Sorry, I couldn't hear. Uh, what does it mean to be a human rights activist and what motivated you to be one? Wow, well, that's a difficult question. I don't know why we are called activists, but basically we try and work together. Um, I think whenever, I suppose I would say that we use um, standard of behavior based on what rights we have under the constitution and what rights we have under international human rights law so when we find that people the people or the state is not subscribing to that what we do is scream out a lot raise our voices go and stand outside the press club and finally write about it we've written a lot of articles in the different media and then take things up to the court and sometimes the court responds positively in some cases they're a bit hesitant to do that it also depends on what the political environment is how much freedom they allow you in your opinion, where does Bangladesh stand in relation to human rights violations? And how can these violations be prevented? Well, I think uh, the best record we have of this is the reports submitted to the UN itself. Uh, you know, there's a rapporteur for violence on women. And she has given a report only recently, I think a year or two years ago, and which shows you exactly what is happening, what kind of violence is taking place against women. And if you look at the media records, they tell you about the numbers of rape. I think you have yourself sent me some figures on uh, from the Ein Shalit Bulletin about the numbers of rape. Now, it could be that the, the rapes are now being recorded much more, that women are now filing complaints much more than they used to. So whether it is an absolute increase or not, I don't know, but everybody's certainly talking about it. So some action needs to be taken. The most important right is, I think, the right to life. And we have mechanisms, we have constitutional rights, that, and then we have judgments from the court. I think the Supreme Court or the High Court has passed in the, I think that was in, um, I, I forget which judgment, the Rubin judgment of it, that you can't arrest a person without cause for more than 24 hours, something like that. Again, my ignorance of the law, you must excuse me. Uh, but the right to life is very important, that you can't kill people without giving them uh, a reason to explain. And, and unless the courts executes them, unless the court passes an order for execution, you can't go around uh, just uh, killing people. But on the other hand, that is just what happens if you look at the numbers that you have quoted to me from the Anshalit Bulletin about extrajudicial killings and then disappearances. So these are, you know, violations, extreme violations about the right to life. And then there are so many other conventions now, the UN uh, conventions, such as uh, rights of ethnic minorities. And we have certainly not got equality over there. When we talk about ourselves, we must talk about not only the mainland Bangladesh, but the different ethnic minorities, the Dalits, and in terms of the urban and the rural community. So these are things that the right to life is very important. And then, of course, the right, the right to political freedom. How much can you express yourself, either through parliament, through the elections, how fair are our elections? That, again, has been reported by the UN rapporteur. And there have been questions raised about Bangladesh's uh, record on human rights. I think we need to look at all of those. And we need to be very strong, come together. You people have a large legal group amongst you. And we must work together, I think, to monitor what is happening. And then, for instance, recently, uh, the Election Commission is supposed to be interested in passing a, a law. Because, you know, they have a law saying that um, they have passed a law, I think, in 2008, saying that um, uh, all political parties registered with the Election Commission must nominate 30% of their committees should be women. But of course, no party has done that. 
And so now, because we've reached the, the date was 2020 when they're supposed to have done this. But since they haven't done it, I think the commission is trying now to change the law itself. Now that, instead of monitoring it over these years to see why they're not doing it, they have, they are deciding to change the law. So here I think it is also our weakness. We should have monitored every year. We should have been after our political parties to act according to their word. But we've been slow at it. In the Gender Equality Index of 2018, Bangladesh ranked 129 out of 162 countries. The GDI reflects gender-based inequalities in three dimensions, reprodu reproductive health, empowerment, and economic activity. Although there has been some development in this area, but, uh, but are these developments enough as even today issues such as child marriage, dowry related violences and discrimination of women at workplace are common in Bangladesh? Well, I think we need to have a you know historical sense because if you go back, that always change. It just depends on we change going backwards or going a little frontwards, where there's little or lot depends. Uh, but society is changing very slowly unless you have a revolution and then you change for a while and it goes back again <laughs> to what it was. But uh, sorry, I'm being very cynical. But but I think uh, Bangladesh, I think, has come, certainly I think the women of Bangladesh, although the situation is still very poor, particularly in terms of personal rights uh, within the family, within certainly marital situation, it's very it's very unequal. Uh, but I think women have come a long way. If you look at, first of all, uh, internationally, in, the, in terms of the international commitments, they have signed the, uh, the convention at the, at the population conference. Uh, they signed the convention and they have introduced some of the policies internationally. And within the country itself, they have now, they used to have a very good program where the, in the family planning, and uh, I forget what it is called, the community centers, but where the field worker, the field uh, population health worker used to go house to house. And that was a very effective program because they actually reached out to the woman in her own house and she felt free to talk and then consult and so on and so forth. That was changed because I suppose they felt that, oh, now the women have become very you know active, they're coming out of their house, so let them come. So that's once they, women were asked to come to the center, I think it slowed down a bit. So these, of course, some of the practical problems. But I think particularly if you look at CEDAW, then we have certainly uh, ratified, but we've still got reservations to those two uh, articles, two and article 16. And in terms of implementing the articles, it, we've, been, we've been very slow about it. And, there are all sorts of, you know, every time, every four years when they give a report, they give reasons for why they haven't. But it also shows that enough effort is not being made. But on the other hand, if you also see there are areas, for instance, local government, women are more active. NGOs are much more active in providing education and particularly awareness building to women. So some steps, I think, have been taken. But I think I would particularly be concerned that not enough has been done for, for women because I think you can't look at women as one whole. The religious differences, I mean, in terms of laws, Muslim women have different laws from Hindu women. In terms of ethnic women, what sort of rights do they have? Are they able to move freely? And the Dalits particularly face discrimination not only from the majority community but also within their own community because they have a lot of dowry problems. But the Constitution of the People's Republic of Bangladesh guarantees women equal rights. But do women in Bangladesh enjoy equal rights? Yeah, enjoying equal rights is a process, I think, of trying to assert your rights, to struggle for your rights, and to make sure that you can then actually practice those rights. And I think, again, if I may say so, that again, I find if you look back at uh, 1971 and the state of uh, the victims of violence in those days, whether you call it, whether it was a rape victim or whatever other kinds of victims of women, 
if you look at the uh, women's situation before 71, I think it's come some ways forward. On the other hand, you can't treat women as one whole. If I'm saying we have equal rights in the constitution, but they also say, and this is open to uh, a debate again, because it says in the public sphere and matters of the state. Now, some people interpret this saying that marriage is also a public sphere. So if I take it as that, then we have equal rights in marriage. But actually, if you look at it, some again, somewhere it has changed. For instance, among for the Muslim women, the Nikah Nama has got a clause added now, which says the woman, you know, put in the condition that women can also have a right. Or in the matters of property where Muslim women are unequal, for instance, uh, a woman gets half of what her brother is entitled to. But now I find because, because it is Sharia says so, and I don't know why, because we should stand by the constitution rather than Sharia, but anyway, because they're afraid of whatever the uh, reaction would be, that does not go. But I see that a lot of people are now in their own lifetime are gifting it away to equally to both their sons and daughters. So in a way, that is one way of overcoming, uh, you know, whatever inequalities. And so gradually, if more and more people start doing that, then I think we will drop the Sharia condition and move on. But it hasn't, it hasn't moved yet. But then again, as I was saying, if you look at women across the board, Hindu women are much worse off in terms of divorce, you know, in terms of property, three and so on. And I'm not sure about the other communities, uh, how much equal they are. This is worth studying, really. But also we have to look at the social situation. One is the law. Is the law enough? Law, law is a good first step towards changing things. But then in, in order to implement it, how do you make it more acceptable to the society as a whole? That is very important. In your opinion, Sorry, can you tell? Can you say it again? Uh, yeah, sure. Appa. Appa, in your opinion, what are the main obstacles of achieving gender equality in Bangladesh? Well, I think what it is anywhere, patriarchy, male power, this incapacity to share. I mean, that is just, if you're using words, I suppose that is it. But uh, historically, I suppose men have always played this, have always controlled uh, property, they've controlled matters of the state. And so to get to that level, we have to start asserting ourselves. Women need to start asserting themselves. Women need to come together and even talk about how, what are the areas. And there are so many areas to start with. I mean, like a lot of women would say, particularly, for instance, the first women's conference, the whole emphasis of, was on women, uh, the first women's conference in Mexico, which was in 1975, uh, they talked about um, economic, economic equality, economic power, and saying if, if only women were in a position, um, was, were in the formal sector that they were, their labor could be counted and calculated, then they would have equality. So then women have since then come into uh, a, a, a visible workforce, whether it's a garment factory or jute or whatever. But there again, you find that they have different kinds of jobs. So they're, they're, they're operators. So they have one pay scale. If the men are supervisors, they have a different pay scale. So there is always a difference between the two. But because they have some access to employment, some their numbers have increased the workforce, then they're within their family, they have some influence, not totally powerful, but they have some influence. Uh, but that is only one part of it. Economic equality or economic power is only one means towards social power and social equality. That takes a lot of doing. I think you need to have the law on your side to some extent, we have laws claiming equality. For for instance, our education policy says education for all. It doesn't happen because then the society, uh, young girls, when they walk to school, they're threatened or they suffer violence. So one has to cope with that problem, with the violence problem. Then one can do that in one way if women are doing that. By, if you notice garment workers, they're walking together in hundreds and twelves and tens rather than walking alone. 
or if you look at the school kids, they're also working together. So they're exercising more strategies in order to get there. And then working towards using the courts. I think women are now using the courts quite a lot to file their complaints. And this is where I think we can all support each other. I see your time is up. Uh, no, I don't My next question is on property, uh, property rights of women. Bangladesh still follows Sharia laws in deter determining how much property a Muslim woman would inherit. And according to it, a daughter's share is half of that of the son and not equal. But still women are being deprived of their rights to even get this much. And in many instances, they are left with nothing. How much does this affect women's empowerment? Well, uh, quite a lot, as I've said before. But I mean, we must understand that uh, what's the poverty level now? Most a lo a large number of people don't have property. They're living in a little hut in the villages. Maybe they have a little kitchen yard because they're working as sharecroppers. So they're earning wages. And now a lot of women are working as wage labor as well in the fields. But in terms of property, you see, again, this, um, we should, I would personally turn to the constitution rights of equality rather than Sharia. But the law as it is, in Bangladesh says per personal rights are subject to whatever is said in the religion. So the Muslim women do have unequal access, um, unequal rights, but maybe in most families they also, as you say, have less access. I think this is something that we have to fight for through the courts probably, through, through making changes within our own families. I mean, when my father made out his property, he he left a will saying he would divide it up equally between each one of us. So there were three brothers, three sisters. We got the same amount. And it wasn't very much, but it just made us feel pretty good that we were there. So I think I think women within each family should now. And obviously, you need to turn to help. So I think we should support each other in doing whatever we can. And if we move this socially, then I think slowly it would also come out as a legal right. But I think that. Besides the Muslim women, I think the Hindu women have even less rights to property. So that should be also their con our concern. Mm -hmm. Even today, a girl child is unwanted. Uh, recently, I saw on a Facebook uh, post that they found a baby girl. She was yeah. killed and she was thrown on the streets. Yeah. So females are facing discrimination at home lesser importance is given to educate them and as a result many women live in a state of dependency and lack confidence which results in them suffering violence silently how can we put an end to this but you know i think um, women the women's movement is making all kinds of demands about representation in in parliament representation different decision making bodies and so on and once they're there, I hope they're making the right noises to persuade whatever decision make is being made. Uh, but I think also, I think we must admit that the governments over the years, we have taken some steps for development, particularly in education. So that now you find that in primary schools and secondary level, there's a larger number of women now, and they're doing very well if you look at the results. It's only when you reach the higher levels, I think the tertiary level, where their enrollment comes down a bit. And I suppose that is the age, uh, probably 16 onwards, where suddenly parents start saying, we must get them married off, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, they won't find good husbands or something like that. But I think also because of the economic changes in our country, uh, the industrialization process and so on, and the need for cheap labor. So women are now entering the workforce, garment works, and unfortunately, after the COVID, it's been pretty bad for them. But before that, so that's that's that makes for changes um, in the workforce. Also means that then they begin to have. I'm not saying that they have it, but they begin to have some decision making since they're supporting their younger siblings, you're supporting their parents to work and so on. And also as they move from the rural society to the urban society, they're more independent. They're working. They're living on their own in a mess with other girls. And so they develop this collective personality and are able to make the kind of demands. But I would say that the state has also 
responded first of all to education and then in terms of health i think they have been given some sort of uh, provisions in the hospitals and so on which is useful for women uh, my next question is that according to i know shalish kendro's bulletin that was published in june this year there were 427 reported cases of rape since january 2000, uh, 2020 till may among them 32 were aged under 6 71 in between 7 to 12 and 56 in between 13 to 18. So recently we can see that there has been a rise in rape cases and often children are being targeted. How alarming is this and what steps can be taken to ensure safety of both women and children? No, of course, if it is correct, I think it is very alarming. Uh, but I think when these reports are made in the media, I think proper investigations should be done. I'm not sure if that is happening in all the cases, maybe in some cases. Because I think we have to be at it. The, the state agencies are, tend to be a bit partisan or tend to be a bit weak. But we have to be at them. And perhaps one way of doing it is for us, uh, particularly legal aid organizations, which are also not only in Dhaka but outside beyond Dhaka, should try and see if they can investigate these scenes and find out. And also, there are indications of uh, such actions before the actions take place, before the violation is committed. There are some indications that people have, for instance, in schools, teachers, teachers might may have a way of judging which particular boy is a wayward person or things of that kind, which we need to be socially, I think, more active in trying to understand what is happening. And again, I would say about the numbers that you have quoted, when we get it from the media, it's probably less than the actual number, you know, because not all the cases are reported. And sometimes women don't, young women particularly, don't talk about it. But I, I don't know whether it's actually uh, the numbers, the ages of young girls who are being violated, whether those ages are now coming down, so people, men are going for even younger girls, or what is happening. That is something that I think psychologists should study seriously and try and understand what it is. Or is it because women are now going to, young girls are now going to school and they have to walk long distances to go to school, so they become easy prey. Whatever it is, I think we need to study it socially, psychologically, and take appropriate steps. It's not just enough then, I would say, to say, I'm providing free education, which is what the government is taking credit for. They have to do much more than that. What sort of protection are we providing? What sort of a society are we building up where people feel so free to commit rape wherever they are on seven years old and 12 year olds? If I again refer to Aino Shalish Kendo's bulletin, 86 women were murdered by their husbands since January 2020 till May. And many of these are dowry related cases, despite there being a specific act uh, known as Jotuk Nirod Ain Dui Hajar Atharo that makes asking for or giving dowry a punishable offense. But has there yet been a significant change in this practice? Yeah, it's, it's uh, been reading about this in the newspapers, and it is very uh, scary and a terrible reflection on what is happening in uh, the country right now. But what people are explaining this by saying that they don't have jobs anymore, they've all gone home and they're suffering from financial loss because they don't have, they're not earning money. And so they're turning inwards and becoming violent. Now why, it's true that I can I can ask the question, you can ask the question, why, why do you have to turn to violence? Why not work together at something? But that is not happening. And again, I don't know, I think a lot of this domestic violence is um, an expression of frustration and a woman becomes an easy target because, you know, a, a man in a family, the head of the family is known also as the boss of the family. So it's very, and unless the woman can find support from outside her own marital home uh, because very often the in-laws also uh, support the man for no reason. But I think it's very important for the 
women in the village to get together. And so many NGOs have been working with women's groups and other groups to work together and form the women into a group. And I think we need to do that uh, because, uh, I mean, in a patriarchal society, a man gets away with whatever he does. Nobody even questions his right to uh, be overwhelmed. You know, so I think that is, one needs to drill that into the head that you can't get away with it. And you can't get away with it if I, if somebody beats me, if my husband beats me, and I have 10 women coming around to support me, he would not dare to do that. And I think we need to do that. And several organizations, NGOs are trying to do that. And where you find that they do, the women get together in a group, then the man is too scared, too nervous. Because basically, this is a cowardly act. And the man only does it because he's in the, what he considers the safety of his home, where no one can tell him that this is wrong. Upper recently 16 distinguished citizens, including you, demanded justice for the attacks on minority communities, uh, violence against women, land grabbing, harassment of common people, and torture on journalists. And all of this occurred during the coronavirus outbreak. And a para paragraph in the letter uh, said, we sadly learned that even in this crisis, fear has spread among minority community people as there were attacks on their lives and livelihoods. Both religious and ethnic minority communities were attacked. There were attempts of land grabbing. Their religious practices and places of worship were attacked. So we heard uh, plenty of stories of how the minorities, minority communities were uh, attacked and tortured for the independence of Bangladesh. And, it's been 49 years since the independence of Bangladesh. In this 49 years, did we as a nation succeed in providing the minorities with the protection and rights that they deserve? Yeah, I think there should be no question of calling us majorities and minorities and seeing us as, you know, this religion or that religion, this ethnicity or that ethnicity. I mean, if I remember uh, my telling you, I said in school, nobody knew whether I was a Muslim or a Hindu. We, I mean, that was long before 47, you know. And this is something that we have to progress towards. Why should we even talk about minorities? But sadly, we do. And yes, um, we, we made that statement about land grabbing and so on, because one of the organizations, ARRD, I think, had actually gone to the area and found that the land, it becomes, you know, particularly when uh, the times are the way we are now. There's so much insecurity. It's very easy for the powerful, particularly in a village, to grab something that belongs to somebody else. And the more um, powerful you are, and you particularly go backed by the ruling regime, then you can, nobody's going to touch you legally, as you find that, you know, the police don't act with there's a powerful party person there or a powerful bureaucrat that somebody who can do something. And usually, the grabbing is done by somebody who's powerful. So it isn't only the land grabbing. Recently, for instance, some temples were attacked. And just, I think yesterday's newspaper, or two days newspaper, I read about this case of a child from an Ahmadiyya committee, a community who could not be buried in the common graveyard. They buried the child there after she died. And the, somebody in the community, against a powerful member of the community, took her out of that grave and gave it back to the family and said, go and bury her in your Ahmadi. So here it is discrimination against the Ahmadiyya community. And so I think we have to, um, well, I think we keep making demands of government, but I think we have to, uh, how we move towards social change is very important. Of course, one of the factors I think is that we are very also affected by what happens in our neighboring countries. So, you know, when you had the public mosque, uh, thing in, in Delhi where they demolished the mosque and th there was a reaction over here and I remember people saying that um, so Odir becomes, becomes Hindu here and over in India it becomes Muslim, you know but rather than saying, look, these are citizens of Bangladesh I mean, you're all working together, you're all school children together, so I think one has to think of things differently and not just put yourself in these narrow compartments of religious or ethnicity. And for instance, in the hill tracks now, there's been violence. There were those two 
Marma girls who were raped. And I think their case is still hanging in the balance. It was filed in the court. I'm not sure what has happened to them now. Uh, so even recently, I've read about violence in Bandarbans, rab by rab, and military people. And that, that is the state acting, because if they're wearing uniforms and acting, then they should be held responsible as members of the state. Papa, if I again come back uh, to the women's issue, often women decide to remain silent when they face violence, and they wait for the worst. Some of them believe that due to the lack of educational qualification or lack of support from their families, it won't be possible for them to survive or support their children. So what advice would you give to these women and how can we come forward and help them? How can support be provided to a friend or family member who is suffering from this sort of violences? Well, frankly, it's very difficult to give advice to anybody because every situation is different, every person's environment is very different. But I think, uh, but you know, the less you have, for instance, a working woman it has, has worked independently, has taken decisions. It's easier for her. For instance, uh, it's economic, financially tough for a garment worker, say, to live only on her own income, maybe. But she has been taking these decisions on her own. So it's, in a way, it's easier for her to make the break. It's more difficult, I think, for a middle class woman who's had a very comfortable life, who is living off her husband, and therefore used to being just, you know, uh, working in the home and not doing anything. It is more difficult for her because, in a way, uh, she thinks that she's going to lose her status. But if I think, my advice would be that women are capable. You see women all over, actually, even the ones who've been staying at home and then are faced with a situation where maybe their husband dies or something, they have to cope on their own. And you find they cope very well on their own. And of course, it's very useful if you can have family support or friends support. But suppose you can't. Maybe you try and go out in the world and face the world a little and see that the world might be kind to you. Who knows? But I think from the outside, I would say, that we should also, as women, support each other, you know. So if you find a woman in a, in a problem, and particularly, I think, if you know that a woman has a problem but is not able to speak out, try and understand why not, rather than shaming her and saying, why don't you speak out? You know, in some cases, it is difficult. Put yourself in her position and say, how would you do it? So instead of coming out, give her the support that she needs and then see how you can help her come out. And now, with I think particularly women's organizations, Mohila Parishad had branches all over the place, so many other groups, that one needs to try and understand what women are going through. And certainly this, um, um, the state itself being very patriarchal, one has to work even harder. Absolutely. Well, we have come to the end of our uh, yeah. program. I have one last question for you. What, uh, do you have any suggestions for organizations like Legal Voice Foundation uh, working for the rights of uh, rights of the people? Yeah, I'm not sure what you do, but I'm sure because there are so many of your lawyers, you must be already doing a lot of cases in court, for which I must congratulate you. I think that is very good, particularly I think if you take constitutional cases or public interest litigations, I mean, because in a way, if you do um, individual cases, that is very good because that helps individuals get out of their miserable condition. But then if you do a PIL, it, it establishes a certain right. Now, the problem with our PIL is that once you have the right in law, then to get it in, implemented, like the Section 54 uh, judgment that we got from the, uh, yeah. from the High Court, I think, or Supreme Court, I don't know where. But how long is it going to take us to get it into practice because the police are still doing that? Or the other judgment that the High Court gave on sexual harassment committees, you know, they specifically said that you must have committees in all institutions to check, to monitor what's happening in the universities and so on. And that has not been acted upon because I think somebody did a survey in the universities and the other factories and so on. And most of them had not set up these committees. So I think this is an area for, student, uh, for uh, citizens' activism. And People like you, your organization, particularly if you line up, why don't you work together with other organizations and support this kind of action? So 
we need to be much more active in the field, monitoring what's happening. And not once, because I think lawyers tend to sit back and say, ah, oh, very good, we've got a law passed, or we've got a good judgment. But then the next step is more difficult, to get the police to understand. I mean, now we have this uh, Black Lives Matter movement in America, see how active everybody's been. I mean, I don't think, uh, I don't mean that we need to be on the streets all the time, but I need, I think as lawyers or people working with legal aid organizations, we need to see the laws actually being implemented and listened to and observed and so on. And that the state is much more citizen friendly. I think the problem is that our state is not citizen friendly. It is more police friendly or lab friendly and we don't get the right answers. We are at the end of the episode. Uh, it has been a huge pleasure for us to have you with us today. Thank you so much again for joining today's program. Well, thank you very much. I hope look forward to seeing you again. Same here, Appa. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Have a good day. Thank you.